Good afternoon. I've been so looking forward to coming here today. I want to thank the organizers of South by Southwest EDU uh, to allow me to speak about this topic that is near and dear to my heart, and I think to all of yours too. Now before I begin to speak about the relationship between creativity and social justice, art and social justice, I want to thank one person, one man, and that is my grandfather. My grandfather allowed me to understand this idea when he was in high school. I learned about this story of him going to high school in Brooklyn, New York. How many people are from Brooklyn here? Woo, yeah. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker, yes. And he was going to high school in Brooklyn. In the 11th grade, he asked his teacher why the history books didn't represent the world the way it looks in this room, right? Why the achievements of men and women always looked a particular way in 1926. He wanted to know where African Americans were in history books, where Asian Americans were, where, where the whole world was. And the answer he received from his teacher, which is that, in particular, African Americans had done nothing to merit inclusion, <laughs> did not sit well with him. He kept asking this question, and he was expelled for his impertinence. So this was the 11th grade, and his pride was so wounded that he never went back to high school, and certainly never got a college degree. He went on to support my family as a janitor by day, and in the evening, he was also a jazz musician and a painter. And I was confused when I was younger about why he would make this decision to go into the arts, right? I thought, well, he could have been an activist, a politician, based on that kind of an experience. But I came to understand from him the power of the arts to shift our vision towards a more capacious notion of justice. And I would like to think that he is no longer with us, but somewhere smiling knowing that his granddaughter here in the United States, now a professor at Harvard, teaching in art history and in American studies and in African American studies. So. <laughs> my name is Sarah Elizabeth Lewis, and my initials are in part to honor him. His name is much cooler than mine, though. It's Shadrach Emanuel Lee. <laughs> much better. But he helped me to understand this topic, and I teach a course entitled Vision and Justice, the Art and Citizenship at Harvard, and I've spent a lot of time writing about this topic. And so today, in order to tease it out for us and to consider what's missing when we don't honor creativity in the classroom, I'd like to present a few case studies to help us consider how the world became the world, how America became America, and how the arts are crucial for this. And I'd like to start by asking kind of a counterintuitive question. And as I ask it, I hope the answer you have now will be different from the answer you have at the end of my short talk. You with me? So the question is simply, can art measure human life? It's not a question we ask very often, right? We often consider the measurement of human life through vastly different means, right? Social science metrics, something like demography, right? Where you live, how that might determine health disparities, different life outcomes. We might even use something as basic as mortality rates to measure human life. How healthy have you been? But there is another kind of currency in social society, and it often comes down to the way in which we represent ourselves through the arts as a way in which we measure our lives. This nexus of art and citizenship, you might say, or art and social justice has real, actual currency today. Quite recently, 
Secretary Jack Lew announced that our currency would change. Right. <laughs> the, here you're seeing what we understand by 2020 will be the face and back of the $20 bill, right? Andrew Jackson will move to the back to make room for Harriet Tubman <laughs> on the front, right? <laughs> you know, and, and on the back of our $10 bill, we'll have our female icons here, including Sojourner Truth and, and all of our suffragettes, many others, right? And of course, Hamilton will remain. Why? Because of the popularity of Lynn manuel Miranda's Hamilton, right? <laughs> he was on the chopping block for a while there. This is an idea with true currency, right? One of the case studies I want us to think about in terms of understanding the historic relationship of art and social justice before we get to the present day takes us back to the 1930s here in Austin, Texas. I want us to consider the way in which the arts have galvanized social movements over time in ways that we don't recognize and often don't use as a form of pedagogy when we should. In 1931, here in Austin, Texas, a young boy named Charles Black Jr. was trying to go to a dance. He was young for his class as a freshman at UT Austin. And he wanted to meet some girls at this college dance at the Driscoll Hotel here in town. He went with a friend of his from Austin High, and there was this band playing. He didn't know the names of any of the musicians, but he did find himself struck still by the power of this one trumpet player. His name was Louis Armstrong. He understood in that moment that he was looking, let's put this image of Armstrong up, of at genius, total lyrical power with fine precision. He had never heard anything like what he did coming out of Louis Armstrong's horn. And he knew in that moment that if there was genius coming out of the body of this black man, that segregation must be wrong. So he, in that moment, found himself internally walking towards justice, as he put it. Now his friend from Austin High recognized that genius too, but shook his head and uttered an epithet about African Americans commonly used during the day, and he walked away. But Charles Black Jr. was sure his life shifted that day. He would go on to become one of the lawyers for the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education case, which outlawed segregation. And he attributes that achievement to this particular moment. He went on to teach at Columbia and Yale at the law schools there as a constitutional lawyer. And every year he held this Armstrong listening night to honor the man who affected in him this life-changing shift. So again, I ask, how many movements have begun when something with true aesthetic power completely alters our perception of the world? As the his teachers and historians in here know, and students too, it was not rational argument alone, but was the power of an image that helped abolish the slave trade, right? This 1789 broadside showed with graphic precision how the British ship Brooks actually could hold in its hull 454 men, women, and children when we know it held even more, up to 740, right? And this was the image used in parliamentary hearings that successfully advocated for the end of the slave trade. In another context entirely, think about the force of an image like what we call here Earthrise, an image taken from the moon of our environment in the 60s that allowed us to finally see this planet that we're all on together as an environment 
to protect and galvanize the environmental movement. A picture could have this kind of coalescent force. But there is one man who understood all of this long ago, and we're only beginning to tap into his insights today. And that man is Frederick Douglass, a man who our president reminds us is being recognized more and more. <laughs> And so I should remind us all, Douglas left us in 1895, <laughs> understood the power of pictures. And before I describe Douglas's insights, I just want to say that if we don't recognize the power of the arts to catalyze moments that can lead us towards social justice, it's because we often only understand it during periods of crisis like the ones we might find ourselves in today, right? Frederick Douglass, during the Civil War, gave a speech in Boston, where I teach, that shocked, surprised his audience, entitled Pictures and Progress. He gave this speech at the Integrated Church, Boston's Tremont Temple near Boston Commons, and he made this unusual case that something as seemingly small as a picture could radically shift our perception of the world. His audience was largely silent as Douglas went on to describe what he meant. His argument wasn't just that it's the work of a masterful artist creating something with force enough to get us to see the world anew but that these works of art can shift our own vision because of our reception of them. He had this beautiful term, thought picture. He thought that our whole internal landscape was filled with these thought pictures, right? And that our work in the world is often to reconcile what we see with that picture we hold in our mind of what can be and work to resolve the difference. He's an art historian, ultimately, right? Frederick Douglass surprised his audience with this speech because he was known to argue for combat, right? They would have expected a speech that would be an ode to the importance of combat to reconcile the Civil War. Of course, Douglass was a man of action, born enslaved in Maryland. President Abraham Lincoln even sought out his counsel regarding emancipation. And Doug, excuse me, President Lincoln had this to say about Douglas. He is, if not one of the most meritorious men, the most meritorious man in the United States. That's how Douglas was seen at the time, right? At a time when orators were analogous to our star athletes and the stage was akin to a boxing ring, you know, Douglas's will and his skill and his style and his intellectual prowess proved to nearly all that, as one journalist put it, quote, this is an extraordinary man, a man cut out for a hero. As a speaker, he has few equals, end quote. So Douglas, for 30 years, redrafted this unusual speech, Pictures and Progress, in his study that I'm showing you a picture of here now in Anacostia in Washington, D.C., near Washington, D.C. And at the end of his speech, he offered this kind of productive loose end. He said, it might take more than 150 years for us to understand what I mean about the power of the arts for justice. And I see that as an invitation for all of us uh, to extend and to reconsider it today. Douglas is asking us to consider these different case studies. There is a reason why his achievements are being recognized more and more, as our president reminds us. And I think he would be delighted <laughs> that we're doing so in this context here today. 
In my course at Harvard, I look at this association between race and citizenship and art and justice, and I consider what's lost when we don't look at American encounters through this perspective. Um, I should say, though, that I came to this work, this understanding, because of my research and scholarship on creativity and the gift of failure. Last time I was here at South by Southwest, I was speaking about that exclusively. There was a moment in researching that topic, which became the book I wrote, The Rise, that I realized that the arts are how we overcome our collective failure. I realized this when I stumbled across something that might interest you. I found this transcript of Martin Luther King's from when he was in seminary. And if you look, you can see he was a pretty good student. But he did receive two C's in guess what class? You can't make this up. Shout it out. Public speaking. Yeah, yeah, inconceivable. Not once, but twice, right? And in fact, he got worse by the teacher's assessment. He got a C plus and then a C. I mean, you have to wonder what occurred in the life of Martin Luther King when he went on to lead the nation with the power of his spoken truth, and also what occurred, right, for that teacher. <laughs> we, don't, we don't always always get it right. But I wanted to understand in that moment, as I started to be interested not just in the internal landscape of how it is that we overcome a failure, um, to s look at the ways in which the power of oratory or the power of the arts, the power of a performance like Louis Armstrong's for Charles Black are the unheralded moments in this long journey towards social justice. And it's the bridge between my past work and the work I'm up to today. Juno Diaz has a line I love that helps me conceptualize this. He said, you know, we all have a blind spot around our privileges shaped exactly like us. You know, how do we get around those blind spots? Oftentimes, it's the arts that lets us do this, that jolts us out of our perception enough so that we can see the world anew. So perhaps it's no surprise that the words to describe aesthetic force suggest that it leaves us somehow changed. You know, and you say, you describe to a friend how something moved you. If it was creative, you often say things like, I was stunned, or I was dazzled, or I was knocked out. All those words that we use describe that perceptual shift that happens in us. Oftentimes, we consider those emotions, those shifts, somehow light or ephemeral, as if they don't have enough force to affect real change. And what Douglas was arguing, what Charles Black is reminding us with that annual Armstrong listening night, what all these many case studies I could outline for you today show us is the need and the urgency to finally reframe the potency of creativity for social justice. So this is to say, I should be clear here, I love what I do in teaching about the arts because I believe in honoring the arts full stop. Right? It's important for innovation. That is reason enough alone for me to want to write about and study and work with artists. But there is something we are missing if we don't also begin to assess the power of creativity and the arts for social justice. And that's why I'm here today. I'm going to show you just one image that I've started to use in my classroom and give you a sense of some of the work I've done that has come into the classroom by way of publications, and end with a short clip that will get us to consider what another one of our presidents had to say 
about the connection between art and justice. This first image I'm about to show you is a way to consider a kind of counterexample. If you don't yet buy my argument that the arts are crucial for justice, just consider what it means when a work of art is too impactful, so much so that it needs to be censored, right? You can't let it be seen. This is an image that Dorothea Lange was commissioned to take at a time when the United States inaugurated a period of Japanese internment, right? This is an image we can find in the US Department of the Interior. It's online in the archives there now, but it shows a citizen Japanese businessman being tagged for removal, right? Taken to an internment camp. Too powerful to show, right? Too much to see. Recently, about a year ago, the landmark photography journal Aperture asked me to guest edit an issue for them, and I focused it on this precise theme, the connection between art and justice. Richard Avedon's image of Martin Luther King, his father and son, Three Kings, is one of the two covers we have here. The other is by a former student, uh, the great Awal Arezku, who just took the photographs of Beyonce pregnant and broke the internet, if you remember those. <laughs> great Ethiopian-born, LA-based photographer. Here are the two. I wanted to mention this because the issue surprised me in terms of the response, and I hope by giving you a few of the stats in terms of the response, it might inspire you to consider how to integrate these case studies and ideas into your classrooms. Aperture is an incredible journal. It's much beloved. But something unusual happened with this issue. It sold 20,000 copies in seven weeks. Right. It was second print run. It was made required reading, a magazine required reading, at New York University, Tisch School of the Arts. My aim was to create an issue that could match the gravitas of this topic by beginning with Frederick Douglass and looking at this idea all the way to the current day by enlisting a range of poets and scholars and writers like Margot Jefferson, Claudia Rankin, my colleague Henry Louis Gates Jr., many others, including photographers like Carrie Mae Weems and Deborah Willis, Latoya Ruby Frazier, and Sally Mann, and the list goes on. This issue is becoming effectively a template, an outline for how I see this work. And I would before showing you uh, the clip, uh, end by, by thinking through what this image tells us about the importance of what I would call, really, to summarize this, this talk, representational justice. Right. This is an image, you can probably guess what's at work here, of a young boy who wanted to know if his hair texture really did match that of the president's. And so what, what happens here? The president leans down to let him know that effectively this boy can become him. Right? You can't see what you can't imagine. Right? If you don't have a model for something, it's, it's very hard to become. This is so much of what the arts do for us. They give us a new vision to work towards. One more I'll show you this because it's, it's fun. And, I, this is one of my favorite pictures of all time. Both are by Pete Souza, a former White House photographer. This is a young kindergartner here who's worried that she's going to get in trouble for missing a day of school for having visited the White House. <laughs> <laughs> and so she, self-possessed as anyone I've ever seen, gets the president to write her a note so she can give it to her teacher to explain <laughs> where she was. We have to track her down and figure out what she goes on to do with her life. This is so remarkable that she got him to do this. And there she is waiting patiently for that note. 
And, and don't you love what Pete Souza has captured in this photograph? President Obama looking uh, so deliberate and serious. He's taking the task, you know, it's quite seriously, right? And he's not smiling, <laughs> he gets it. And behind her, beneath that portrait of George Washington, are wounded veterans, and it's the wounded veterans meeting that's brought her here. Her parents are part of the group. I just find this, this image so arresting and so powerful, but it's certainly, in a really lighthearted way, I think gives us a sense of understanding the power of the arts for social justice. It also gives us a sense of thinking about the ways in which our own perceived failure, you know, she's worried she's going to get in trouble, <laughs> allows us to summon a kind of bravery that could result in a moment like this. So I mentioned to you that I teach on this topic at, at Harvard uh, and love talking about it more broadly. I'm doing a civic course, actually, at the Brooklyn Public Library. Yeah, in a few weeks. And I have to think my, my grandfather's smiling about that, that too. As a way to uh, kind of honor the magazine issue and the course, the Kennedy Center in Washington, through the invitation of my colleague uh, Damien Wotzel from the Aspen I Ideas Festival and Aspen Institute, wanted to create a multimedia piece that could crystallize these ideas somehow and put them on the stage. I had no idea how to execute something like that. But I was so inspired by the ways in which I, I can feel us creating community around this topic. That something came out that I, I'd like to present to you here today. It's a very short clip. With my students, I workshopped and considered this speech that has been forgotten, really, that our President John F. Kennedy delivered about the power of the artist as a contributory citizen in helping us work towards justice. So I'm going to play you that clip. And because I don't think anyone can really follow JFK, I will only say a few words after. If sometimes our great artists have been the most critical of our society, it is because their sensitivity and their concern for justice, which must motivate any true artist, makes him aware that our nation falls short of its highest potential. I see little of more importance to the future of our country and our civilization than full recognition of the place of the artist. If art is to nourish the roots of our culture, society must set the artist free to follow his vision wherever it takes him. We must never forget that art is not a form of propaganda, it is a form of truth. And as Mr. McLeish once remarked, of poets, there is nothing worse for our trade than to be in style. In free society, art is not a weapon and it does not belong to the sphere of polemics and ideology. Artists are not engineers of the soul. It may be different elsewhere, but democratic society, in it, the highest duty of the writer, the composer, the artist, is to remain true to himself and to let the chips fall where they may. In serving his vision of the truth, the artist best serves his nation. And the nation which disdains the mission of art invites the fate of Robert Frost's hired man, the fate of having nothing to look backward to with pride and nothing to look forward to with hope. I look forward to a great future for America, a future in which our country will match its military strength with our moral restraint, its wealth with our wisdom, its power with our purpose. I look forward to an America which will not be afraid of grace and beauty, which will protect the beauty of our natural environment, which will preserve the great old American houses and squares and parks of our national past, and which will build handsome and balanced cities 
for our future. I look forward to an America which will reward achievement in the arts as we reward achievement in business or statecraft. I look forward to an America which will steadily raise the standards of artistic accomplishment and which will steadily enlarge cultural opportunities for all of our citizens. And I look forward to an America which commands respect throughout the world, not only for its strength, but for its civilization as well. And I look forward to a world which will be safe, not only for democracy and diversity, but also for personal distinction. So this has not been a talk about tactics, but how to incorporate the arts into the classroom. My hope is that this talk has been one that has inspired you to consider what is lost when we don't, right? To not only consider the arts as a, a luxury, a kind of a respite from life, but as integral to create the very society in which we hope to live. Thank you.